And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Michael Jansen is Chief Research Guru at Everest Group. As a co-founder of our research practice, Michael is well known for his ability to hypothesize clever and challenging ideas based on his fact-based insights across business and IT processes, sourcing models, and industries. Abhishek Sharma, partner at Everest Group, is a member of the pricing assurance team and assists clients on topics related to price and contract benchmarking, strategic engagement reviews, and sourcing cost rationalization. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Michael. Take it away, Michael. All right, thank you, Tracy. Um, pricing is one of my favorite topics, uh, having been part of uh, uh, the outsourcing and sourcing industry for the past 30 plus years. Uh, it always comes down to pricing. So uh, once you get past the, uh, the all the glamour of the sales process with all its fun and games and you get done to go through the negotiations and the deal gets done, um, it comes down to execution and it comes down to the bill. And that's the month to month realities that people are doing. So how is value is delivered? How is it measured? And if you get a bad metric or out of market pricing, it inevitably leads to dissatisfaction in the overall uh, relationship or the outsourcing deal. So we pay attention to this stuff. Uh, it has incredible impact over, uh, uh, you know, in the, both the short term and the long term in, in, the, in, the, in that context. So the focus of this webinar is really going to be about some of the current pricing trends. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the price movements and some of the outsourcing contract tenants. So let's move to our first fun. We're going to start the webinar with a fun fact. And so what we've done is kind of gone to our databases and looked at some of the, the interesting things here. And uh, let me turn it over to, to, to Abhishek here, but we're gonna talk about uh, some of the facts that some of the hot skills that are no longer uh, as hot as they used to be. Sure, <clears throat> thanks, Michael. So this is, this is a, an interesting uh, set of uh, facts as, as, as depicted on the slide. Um, skills uh, which are like SAP S4 HANA, automation testing, mobile development, pretty ubiquitous, uh, pretty much high volume skills. Uh, do they command a premium? Yes, they do. Do they command the premium which they used to a couple of years ago? Aha, uh -huh. now that's the trick. They actually don't, right? So the premium for these has dropped anywhere between five to eight percentage points from what it used to be uh, and spread across a large number of resources. It could mean quite a neat amount. So just to give you some examples, um, you know, SAP S4 HANA premium over Java is down by about seven to eight percentage points. Uh, mobile development premium over Java again down by five to seven percentage points. So the jump is, or the reduction is pretty significant. Um, and, and this is one of the elements why we actually feel we should care about pricing because what may be a great deal at a point in time, two years later, there's a high probability it's not such a great deal. So if you're an employee looking at this webinar, you're saying, you know, maybe I shouldn't be going in the direction of those skills. But um, if you're looking to know what's hot, I think uh, data scientists and AI uh, analysts are doing pretty good right now. Yep. All right. So let's move into the core of the of the of the presentation here. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about how the pricing models are changing, uh, but not in this, not always in the same direction or same velocity. Uh, we're going to talk about those pricing term movements with some specific example, and then we'll talk about the evolution of the contracting tenants. All right, so let's move into the page six. Yeah, there you go. So what are those definitions? Let's, let's get with the baseline here, Abhishek. Uh, what are some of the definitions that you use? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and because we're going to talk a, a little bit about the models, it, it makes sense to just baseline everyone's understanding because these, these could be construed differently uh, depending, depending on the context or, or the conversation. So the way we define this, uh, these three models, as we're going to talk about them, uh, output-based pricing um, is all about the operational result, right? So think of a processed invoice, a processed claim, so to speak. So that's where the pricing is uh, hinged upon that. Outcome-based pricing is where the pricing is linked to the actual business outcome. For example, um, savings achieved from sourcing and category management. Very tangible, very directly linked to the business. And then, of course, input-based pricing is on a rate per hour or per day basis, which is linked to the input effort or time of uh, of the particular um, you know worker. So this is the these are the fundamental definitions which you're going to use as we as we go through uh, a few of the subsequent slides. So Abhishek, you're not necessarily saying that one is better than the other. 
uh, it's more of a, a, a situational what, what's appropriate. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's very premature at any point to say what's better for the other. I, I've seen absolute, um, absolutely wonderful relationships, great value for both parties on the humble FTE-based model. Uh, and we've seen absolute disasters on outcome-based models as well, right? And, and vice versa, right, so to speak. So yeah. it, it's all dependent on the context and, and the contours of the deal rather than, hey, let's just move to outcome, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think outcome sounds the sexiest in terms of, of the value proposition, but I also know it's the riskiest and it's also the most difficult to implement over the long term. Absolutely. So, so let's look at some of that data. Right. So um, this is based on um, based based on a, a, a survey we did, um, you know, sometime in in the second half of last year, um, and 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 basically, you know, what 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 this. What, what this says is that yes, at a macro level, across deal types, uh, there's a clear intention to move from input-based pricing to outcome and output-based pricing. Not to say that one is disappearing versus the other. It's just it's just a portfolio mix as it's evolving, as contracts evolve, um, you know, and and as client expectations kind of change. Now, what are some of the key messages? You know, clearly, you can see that outcome and output-based models are filling up space, which tends to uh, which is being located by fixed price and input-based pricing. Um, so fixed price is definitely, um, if you go from left to right, expected to see a downward trend uh, consistent across IT apps and BPO. Uh, Outcome-based pricing expected to be more prevalent in BPO, primarily due to the linkage with business metrics. So you can see that it's it started to grow, but clearly, um, you know, the, the the spin is more on 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 the BPO side. Um, on the other hand, IT apps, as you can see, um, you know, the, the, the jump tends to be more on the output based, primarily because currently there's much more of, uh, of, of, of IT apps being contracted on the fixed price NFT basis, right? So, so we're going to see the, uh, more of, you know, per application, per story point kind of pricing as, as, as the way things are moving. And then, of course, input based, uh, which is primarily FT, uh, will potentially see a bit of a downtrend across both IT applications and BPO. So again, at a macro level across deal types, you know, clearly, clearly some big movements coming up. So Abhishek, when I look at this stuff, I, it really, really reflects on how we have the evolution and the value propositions for the outsourcing industry. I mean, it, it's clear that when we, when we started making the big uh, labor arbitrage, the move to offshore um, and the cost savings there that the input based or the FTE pricing was prevalent and it was, was very much higher than it's ever been uh, in the past. In fact, if I go back in history to my early days in the outsourcing industry, it was almost all output based. And so when I look Absolutely. at this and as we move to more digital kind of value propositions, more automation, it looks like we're returning to that, make it full circle on that uh, output based conversation. Correct, correct. And, and, and it is making a full circle, uh, no doubt about it. But one of the things that I also want to point out as kind of you know, articulated on, on the next page, as you'll see, is that while, you know, the move is definitely towards output and outcome uh, on digital focused deals, you know, mostly if you look at agile delivery, uh, we're seeing more of TNM and managed capacity sequentially moving to fixed fee and output based. So effectively, what this means is that while the moving trend is there, it's not something which happens end block. It's not like, hey, you know, this is a set, my portfolio currently, let's move it all together to, to an output and outcome, right? It happens in some discrete steps, right? So for relatively new skills or delivery models, uh, there's a sequential movement potentially from time material where uh, there is, especially for agile as we're seeing, where there's it's very difficult to define what the output looks like. It's very difficult to align on a lot of things, uh, and it's based a lot more on learning as you go, the, the whole tenet of Agile. Um, generally, organizations, both parties, would want to start with, with TNM. Uh, quickly moving into some kind of a managed capacity, right, as ways of working develop, uh, potentially then to a fixed fee to get some more clarity or some more uh, certainty of spend. And then finally, um, as there is a, you know, as you can see, as, the, as there's a wall, or a reference set of uh, precedents developed, um, you know, moving into some kind of a first story point developed, right? But, but, but then it takes some time and, and it takes some effort uh, to get there. So again, uh, I, I just want, um, you know, 
all the participants to 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 take away that while the movement is there towards output and outcome, uh, from an enterprise perspective, it may not be just in a single jump, right? It, it's going to take a few steps, especially for some of these newer delivery models. Yeah, so this reflects a different way than, than maybe in in the good old days, if you will, where you you kind of wrapped all these different types of stages and value propositions into one one massive deal, and you kind of uh, while there was investment up front. Uh, that investment was assumed by the many times by the service provider. So here we're, we're being more discreet about it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of the things uh, again, you know, and, and this was this is again from what what we what we understood and, and what we gathered from the survey which we conducted, uh, and as we led through some of the the industry stakeholder interactions, uh, this came to the fore as well. Um, so in many cases, it's the enterprise which will have to push through some of these pricing model changes, right, uh, to realize high impact. Uh, and counterintuitively, uh, the most value realization came in the face of neutral to pretty low levels of proactiveness from service providers. Right? Uh, initially, you know, we, we thought that either it's, a, it's an error or it was something very, very situational. But when we internalized it a bit, when we kind of you know, just, just mulled over it and, and thought why this could be causing it, and, and through further conversations with stakeholders, um, you know, we realized, uh, and I'll use an, an, an analogy to, to, to kind of you know, bring it to four. Right? So uh, everyone will potentially lend you a dollar. right? Uh, very few will lend you $100. So, so put, putting this in this perspective, uh, providers, for obvious reasons, um, can't really blame them, will want to retain their revenue streams. It's very difficult to just move uh, pricing models where potentially there will be a major revenue impact. And, and for sometimes for the right reasons, because uh, some investments have been made, there's some projections which have been made, and it's very difficult to just you know, turn it over. So whenever there could potentially be a, 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 a huge delta on revenue, uh, it's natural to see some resistance, right? Um, so, however, if the cost impact is low, uh, you know, we'll see there's some more proactiveness to help the client evolve the client relationship further. So, I think this is where uh, it, it's a message for the enterprises that um, it, it, it has to be a, a joint effort and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the impact, a, a lot of the push through will have to come from enterprises rather than just depending on the service provider side to make those changes. Yeah, I think that's that's a real you know dilemma for the service providers. Uh, you know, they want to be proactive, they want to show good intent, uh, but at the same time, you know, they're they're there to maximize their profit and at least to you know make their bonuses and their goals. So, you know, they're challenged with what's the right timing and and you know, do I want to open up a deal uh, potentially that may you know, in, in you know, at least decrease my profitability in the short term. And that's always a dilemma: open it up or keep it closed. Yeah. All right. So let's move into the next section here, where we talked about some of the, the actual the, the some of the pricing metrics and the price movement we're actually seeing in the marketplace. And so we're going to start that with a quick poll here. And um, and you know this is an interesting case study. This is a real life case study we're going to do in the about coming, but we want to get your perspective. And you know how much do you believe that there is a the maximum variance between a competing bid on an infrastructure type deal? So we've actually looked at some deals. And we said, you know, here's what the, the variances were between uh, some live deals. So take, take a shot at this. Uh, let me know what you think in terms of your answer. And we'll post those in just a second. Okay, we're, um, we'll leave it open for another five seconds. Wow, there's a, uh, there's a polarization in the answers coming in here. There's some, well, it's changing a little bit now. I think some people are going to be surprised by the answer. All right, let's shut it down and we'll post the answers there. All right, so um, I, when, I, when I first saw the answers, they were, there were kind of polarizations around the two end, less than 21% and greater than 50, but it looks like we settled in the, in the uh, kind of even distribution on the 21 to tw less than 21, 21 to 30, and 31 to 40. Uh, so pretty, pretty even distribution there. Abhishek, what did we find in the in the real life scenario that you just uh, that you're going to talk about in this case study? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about two scenarios, uh, you know, which we've laid out, uh, of course, anonymized. Uh, the variance that we, the maximum variance that we've seen over the past 12 months is actually 83 percent for infrastructure. So, so think of you know one bid coming in at 
1x, um, the highest bid out of a group of three coming in at 1.83x. So again, this is, if you look at the scenario, as you see in the screen, a multi-total renewal, uh, competitive, 83% uh, difference. Now, we could have argued that maybe it's an anomaly, but uh, there's another dual topper deal, right? Again, different geography, different set of providers, um, so to speak. Even there, the difference is, is as high as 46%, right? And these are just representative out of a set that we have. Of course, it's not to be seen in every deal. You know, some deals come rather within the range which some of the participants had mentioned in the poll, but the, but the degree of variance and the frequency with which we're seeing these variances has definitely increased over the past 12 to 18 months, right? So, uh, so I think that's, that's what's causing, um, it, it often causes confusion in the minds of the enterprise because you know, it's just very difficult for strategic sourcing, procurement, IT to, to believe you, you know, what's really the best value. Is someone um, underpricing just to, just to buy the deal? Uh, is someone under solutioning? Have they really understood what the scope is? So, so yes, I think these are interesting times from a, from a deal evaluation perspective. Are you sure they got the same? Are you sure they got the same RFP there? Oh yes, absolutely. Down to the down to the last word. All right. Yeah. So 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 definitely, this is something which uh, which we've um, yeah which we. Oh, now go ahead. Go ahead, Abcheck. Yeah, absolutely. And and what are we causing this? Right. So so, so as you can see. Um, you know, and, and we internalize this this quite a lot, and and, and we study the number of things um, discussed with the client as well, just clients as well, just to make sure that everyone had the same set of information. So, so here's here's what we believe. Um, you know, the three major elements which are causing this variance. You know, uh, and we and we've kept aside competition and the, and the desire to win the deal as, as as one thing because because that would cause only only a very limited set of variance, right? It's not able to explain the 83, 46, even the 25 to 30 percent. So the first one is that, you know, um, the skewed assumptions, right? Many times uh, the, the RFPs may not be very prescriptive on what solution they want, right? So we've seen some providers go in with the most conservative assumption possible uh, around offshore ratios, dedicated resources, and then that often tends to bloat the overall price, right? So with enterprises looking more for, hey, what solves my problem? rather than, hey, I want six people just based out of here, and they need to speak this kind of English, and they need to have this much of dedicated, they're pretty open to that. As long as you know the provider can give them the comfort that yes, it is possible in a lean model, they're pretty fine with it, right? And sometimes it takes that bit of a jolt to make them understand that what they're expecting or what they potentially would have demanded doesn't really make economic sense for them, right? So, so the value add isn't there. So, First off is the skewed assumptions, right? So, so that's what causes a bloat in some providers' pricing. The second element what we saw was some degree of over-solutioning, right? So especially around, uh, so in the, these two cases, that there was a bit of a transformation expectation. Uh, the higher bids had a significantly significant levels of over-solutioning, right? So complex transformation solutions baked into, in, into the fee structure. Now, many of the transformation solutions have an overall net cost positive impact because they can take out cost. Many of them don't, right? So many of them are more focused on broader improvement, compliance, et cetera, which sometimes is a good to have, but not everyone would, would want to have that kind of a budget or a focus you know, going forward, especially in an area like infrastructure where things are changing pretty drastically. So, so that's the second element. The third element, of course, um, you know, it's ubiquitous in every conversation. Hey, what's the financial impact from automation that, and other tools uh, which has been committed? So, so these are some things which could cause material variation in the overall fee. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to have very strong uh, platform play, automation, AI, all the good things, all the good words you can think about. The other thing is how much is it really impacting the committed fee? Because uh, whether we like it or not, uh, that is something which enterprises will compare. So, so I think it's a mix of these three elements which, which is really, really causing that variance. Um, so it's very important for uh, both sides, uh, both the service provider and also the enterprise side to, to constantly, uh, or, or at least do a very uh, robust calibration of the bids that come in, right? Because not to say that the cheapest one is gonna be better, but, but it does require some level of second order calibration to make sure that you get the best value. Yeah, and, and Abhishek, if we look at the industry from a macro standpoint, uh, and you look at what the service providers, the margins, you know, the, the, the numbers you showed on the previous page are not indicative of margin uh, 
differences between one supplier and another. So when I look at this, I got to say there's assumpt those assumptions or something is 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 different about the the what uh, is either being bid on or, or thought to, or, or the services or solutions being provided. So I think it's really incumbent upon organizations and enterprises to think about, you know, why is that different? Why is there a difference in those prices? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not to do with a particular enterprise or, or, or a particular service provider or how they potentially price it. It's more about how they're understanding that situation and bidding. Yeah. So I mean, if you don't understand why there's a difference, that's probably a, that's a, probably shame on you for not getting to the bottom of that conversation. So, um, and I think as we we move to the next page here, another one of the things that that comes into play is this is another one of our fun facts, if you will, uh, comes into a. Um, play where the prices are moving quite quickly. And so we see uh, significant differences in the prices from year to year. And so if you're not, a, if if a, one of the suppliers or service providers happens to be using an old price book, um, I'll, I'll use that those in, in generous context, uh, they may not be providing uh, up-to-date market pricing. So that could be one here. And, and Abhishek, why don't you show, talk to us about what these really represent? Sure, absolutely. So we've just picked up a smattering of uh, of, of resource units, right? So, so common ones across private cloud, uh, storage management, or uh, you know, security management. What's happening is that if if you look at a span of two years, uh, the overall market pricing range, and it could vary depending on scenario, and that's why I've given ranges, uh, have dropped anywhere between you know 15 to 20 percent to as high as 40 to 45 percent. Now, what this means is that if um, you know in a contract, people are still using. Uh, the rates that were existing th existing three to four years ago, uh, and when they compare it against the market, it's definitely going to be going to be a huge difference. Now, we don't mean to say that every contract needs to constantly move the pricing as it goes along, but the trick is that when renewal time comes, uh, the expectation you know for some of these resource units shouldn't be that hey, for storage, for example, you know I was at X as a relation to market relationship. I'm going to take it to 0.85x, right? That may look good on paper, but as compared to the market, the prices have actually fallen by 40, 45, 50%. So that's what, you know, even, even at an individual resource unit level, I'm not talking about the overall PCO, these things need to be calibrated very, very carefully in the infrastructure space. All right, so Abhishek, this shows some pretty dramatic price movements of technology-based units. Uh, let's mm -hmm. go on and talk about something that's much more stable. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at, um, and that was more on the IT infrastructure side, you know, definitely an area which is uh, which is moving pretty fast, pretty drastically, uh, and leading to some pretty interesting conversations uh, at the negotiating table. Now, uh, w w what's seen on applications? So here on the on the screen, you can see some pretty plain looking charts. You know, almost flattish unless one would take a, a bit of a fine tooth comb or a microscope and, and look through what the changes are on decimal points. Having said that, uh, why is this important? Right? It's important, mark my words. Because for offshore locations, there's always talk of inflation and lack of ability to find the right talent. Uh, however, you know, the benefits of foreign exchange are flowing in, right? And Honestly, it is a buyer's market, and, and here we're talking more for the, the 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 typical, you know, more generic skills rather than some of the very new age or, or, or emerging skills, right? So uh, it's a buyer's market. The benefits of foreign exchange are flowing in, um, and, and that's what's causing a, a bit of a flattish um, curve there. On even on the even on the onshore side, uh, there could be a minor uptick in rates uh, due to more demand for local resources, but you know, with inflation mostly being in control and again, some degree of competition, uh, the prices are more or less stagnant. Now, what, what does this mean for enterprises? It means that whenever faced with a, a, a bill or a request to suddenly jack up the prices because of a number of reasons, uh, it's important to calibrate against what where the market is going rather than just take a blind view on, hey, this inflation report says, X percent inflation in, in that country because it's not it's not really always a direct um, you know lift and shift from inflation into what the cost element is for there. So there, there are multiple market dynamic elements uh, which need to be taken into consideration. So so yeah, again, as much as it's important to calibrate the infrastructure pricing, even for ongoing uh, renewals or ongoing um, changes in IT applications pricing for the typical standard run kind of roles. Uh, Definitely important to keep this calibration in mind. 
and and I would call it call attention to the the the, the real kind of tail two worlds that are starting to, to quickly develop here uh, with the U.S. U, uh, European markets where we are actually running into a significant shortage of, of talent and and the focus on restricting immigration and stuff like that are and, and the and the population demographics are going to lead to uh, potential for substantial increases in the onshore while at the same time some of the offshore locations specifically India have a constant supply of resources so that will have a, a tendency to damper uh, the wage inflation there uh, as we especially as we've seen at the, at the uh, more commoditized skills and uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier so uh, while these charts look fairly flat there's still some underlying uh, dynamics that you have to watch for there but I think the watch word here is you know don't get don't get uh, you know get the facts don't get sucked into a, a conversation around uh, hype yeah absolutely all right so as we move into the last section here we're going to do another quick poll here and um, and, we're, and one of the uh, another fan favorite topic is the cola living the cost of living adjustment the cola uh, how often does that come into negotiation and, and how frequently is that part of the conversation so is that uh, in less than 21%, uh, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, and greater than 60? Um, and while we're doing that, I, I will uh, relate a story here. Um, you know, I remember this in my early days. Uh, I was negotiating. I was in, at an outsourcing provider and negotiating with a, with a bank. And I was amazed how uh, we were talking about a lot of things I thought were rather small line items, you know, inventory and prepaids and a lot of other things that were relatively small uh, dollar amounts, uh, but there was a clause in the back of the contract, you know, page 75 of the contract that really talked about COLA. And I knew in my head, as I did all the financial modeling, that that was the single most important uh, adjustment in the uh, contract. And all the things we were talking about in the that seemed important to this bank president uh, literally were almost like the the, 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 the the nits and nats and the big number was in the COLA. And if we can, and he didn't ask for any adjustments on it. He didn't even really pay attention to that. So um, let's see what the answers are here. Okay, we got a little bit of a bifurcation here uh, at the high end and at the low end here. So greater than 60% of the situations is the overall winner here. But uh, so that, so there really must be two people, two different people. People are seeing two different sides of the of the, the equation here. So Abhishek, take us through some of the some of the things you're seeing. Sure. Yeah. And it's interesting to see that polarization. And this is me, you know, recounting uh, over the past kind of, you know, 12 months between April 2018 and April 2019, the number of conversations we've been in uh, and the conversations could be renewal situations, conversations could be the contracts we man and enterprise strategic sourcing coming up to to, to us and, and, and checking for, you know, our perspective. This is a theme which has come up in over 75 percent of those conversations. Right. Um, you know, be it an engagement review, any, any, and, and with discrete uh, enterprise clients, right? So, uh, and I've got a bit of a story to tell here as well. Um, in, in my early days of my career, obviously, um, you know, not as far as as Michael's career goes, <laughs> but but in hindsight, about a decade ago, uh, I thought this topic would be standardized to perfection in a couple of years. So this is me in 2009 thinking that hey. You know, as we look forward, it's going to be a lot more about different pricing models, you know, may, maybe some other contract terms. This is just going to be completely standardized and almost like a fixture. Um, it's just amazing how often this topic comes up in so many discussions. Right? So, like I said, over 75 percent. And it's not just in passing. This is a significant point of debate, discussion, enterprise sourcing, wanting to understand a lot of things. Right? Around, first off, are we paying too much? Right. What the correct index how do we ensure it's fair for both parties the most prevalent calculation model anything and everything you can think um, you know this you know this tip I won't be wrong if I'd say that this is this is among the top five things uh, that that enterprise sourcing wants to discuss when they're looking at uh, when they're looking at a particular contract so yeah definitely something um, as we can see from the poll as well uh, you know a segment of, of the respondents do feel that that this is coming up more and more for discussions yeah, again, I think it also goes back to, you know, the nature of the contract goes back to that. Is it an infrastructure technology based or is it a labor based? Um, if, yeah. you, if you've got uh, movement in both directions or movement that's they're not consistent from the, the two plays. 
And then I'd also add in here that comes into play is the, the, the step functions we're seeing with automation replacing labor. So that comes into play here as well. That's a productivity factor that, that adds to the complexity of this discussion. So uh, let's move to the next one. We have a little fun fact around here and, and we get into the dialogue around inflation uh, with respect to, uh, to India. So what, uh, Abhishek, you're, you're, you are keenly attuned to this conversation. Yep, absolutely. So the fact is that despite inflation, uh, prices for basic entry level skills in India have either remained constant or decreased over the past three years, right? This is due to competition, oversupply, uh, and a lot to do with Indian rupee depreciation, right? So, so again, this, is, this, this kind of moves counter to, to cost of living adjustments, right? So, uh, and, and not just in new deals, right? Even for existing ones, we're seeing pushback from enterprises asking for cost of living adjustment. Uh, to be absorbed, or if not fully, at least partially, because they don't, they, you know, more and more enterprises tend to be uh, quite miffed, if I may use the term, uh, about um, seeing a constant, um, you know, addition in bill by anywhere between three, two and a half, three, five, seven percent, depending on the index and the formula used, right? So, so, so when they compare it against, you know, where the market price is moving versus the average uh, annual increase in the bill that they see. Uh, I think I think that that's what's causing uh, a bit of a divergence uh, over there. The one thing I want to mention is that for specialized digital focused skills like cloud machine learning, uh, obviously you know because these are new, the supply isn't as abundant as your typical Java SAP kind of resources. Uh, for for these, that we've been obviously seeing increased rates at at entry level. So so let's keep that separate. But this is more about the general um, you know high volume run kind of skills, right? So 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 yeah. That's, uh, that, that, that's something to take away. The one thing I also want to mention here is that um, enterprise sourcing stakeholders are now expecting uh, providers to manage a bit of the cost of living adjustment, not just by FX movement, but also um, you know, rotation of staff, um, you know, how do you get to more leaner delivery loads, you know, as time progresses, relationship progresses, can you reduce a bit of the overhead so that you know, both parties can get the benefits of that. So, so yeah, that's important to understand from a, from, from, a, from an enterprise expectation perspective. Yeah, and, and, and Abhishek, I want to bring a macro perspective back into here because this is something that, you know, my first trip to India was like in 2003. And, you know, we looked at it and said, okay, you know, there's, there's obviously an opportunity here. Uh, the, the, the wage differences are significant and real. But, you know, we got all, our, all the, the financial analysts are covering this, this space. We all looked at it and said, okay, well, if we do the, you know, salaries are going up in the U.S. by this much, salaries are going up this much in India. Uh, they're going to um, come together, or at least reach a, a point of parity that's not worth, you know, the talking about. And we said all that was going to happen in 2012, 2013, where, you know, the, the India wages would be 70% of the U.S. wages. And I would say that's happened in many of the global high, hot skills. But what we did not get right back in the early days of this conversation was the understanding of the supply capacity of India. And that's when you, you know, we, we led this conference or this, this webinar off with a, a conversation around, you know, the hot skills command a premium, but then they, they uh, once, once the engine of the schools and the corporate training programs come to bear, they can bring a lot of resources. They can bring 10,000 resources. They can bring 50,000. They can bring a hundred thousand. They can bring a half million resources, which, tends to suppress the prices. And that's what we've seen at the lower end of the commodity skills that Abhishek was just talking about. And I see no end to that. I, I've, uh, you know, at some point I said, hey, there, there will be a, 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 you know, the end of labor arbitrage. And I think, um, especially in the more commoditized or the lower end skills, I think that is not going to happen for, I hate to put out another prediction that, that'll be proved wrong later, but I think that will never happen or at least in the, in, the, in the many decades to come, because I think there's just a fundamental supply and demand that allows that, uh, that, that fantastic engine, the education system and the engine that India has built um, until they change some of the population demographics. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, so, so why, why does this come up? And, and we, were, we were actually, um, and I'm sure, you know, the, the, there's a lot of questions just like it, it entered in my mind as to, you know, why this is coming up. And, and, and mind you, these are blue chip, large scale enterprises with sophisticated, um, you know, sourcing, strategic sourcing, vendor management teams. Right? Now, one of the things which you realized was that given that, given the innate simplicity sometimes 
about the cost of living calculations, that's where it's prone to a lot of you know, interpretation on what milestones to apply, the index, the sensitivity, what's the formula to be used. Uh, and because it happens almost on a compounded basis year on year, there's a high probability that if it's skewed, uh, it can be a what we call a hidden choke point or a hidden value depreciator over time. So imagine, you know, one wrong step or one misaligned calculation, uh, which is not with aligned to market norms in, in year one, uh, multiply that with, with, with three times of a three year contract, right? You know, five times if it's if it's over five years, right? So 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 that's where you know it causes a lot of value depreciation. Just to give you an example, uh, there was a contract which we reviewed last year where um, the clause was highly skewed towards the service provider, both in, in terms of everything, the index used, uh, the sensitivity of the or, the or the part of fee in which the COLA was applied somehow didn't, didn't appear right. Uh, and, and most importantly, the formula simply transferred almost all of that adjustment to, to the annual bill. What we figured out was that compared to market good practice, the index, the formula used versus what they were using, over the life of a five-year contract, the client ended up paying 11% more in total fee just because of COLA, just because of cost of living adjustment uh, as compared to market good practice. And 11% isn't against a, a cost of living adjustment of zero, no. So let's say the fair amount would have been X, uh, you know, it, the, 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 the net delta in overall fee was, was like 11%. So that's where uh, I think it's coming up. Organizations are realizing, enterprises are realizing that, hey, while the intent is not to pass on everything and have the provider bake in an inordinate amount of risk, but it's got, it's got to be equitable. It's got to be you know, well shared, right? So, and, and a lot of that has to do with the elements which I spoke around, the index, the sensitivity, the formula. Uh, and and there's, some, there's some established good practices around it. I think the trick is just to uh, put that level of rigor uh, in the negotiating table while drafting the contract. Yep, and it goes back to the conversation I was having, you know, it's still an issue, it's just like it was, uh, you know, a few decades ago. If you get this yep. wrong, it's the single biggest uh, lever in the contract, so. Yeah. Okay, let's let's uh, let, let's change gears now. Uh, we, we've talked about cost of living adjustment as one contract tenant. Uh, the other thing that generally tends to get into some kind of heated conversation is the service management regime, right? So what we're seeing is, um, if you look at, you know, two time frames. let's compare for ease of comparison, 2016, 2017, um, the typical range of fee at risk, and fee at risk is kind of, you know, the overall monthly fee, which uh, the cap uh, at which uh, any service level credit uh, is, is payable, right? So that's the total fee at risk should uh, any service levels go wrong. Uh, typically we saw, um, you know, for most of the deals across IT apps, BPO infrastructure, it being negotiated somewhere around 11 to 14 percent. Right. Uh, over the past couple of years, we can definitely see uh, enterprises demanding more. Uh, that from 11 to 14, it's gone up to almost like 14 to 16 percent. So 13 to 14 seems to be the baseline, and some enterprises starting the discussion is maybe demanding something like 17 to 18, and kind of you know the negotiating table getting it down to 14 to 16 percent. Now. What's really causing this, right? Well, what's causing this is not the enterprise wanting to make money out of it because that's never really the intent. That's never really the, the objective behind a service level penalty. Um, it's more to do with um, because the deals are more complex, uh, because there's a lot more uh, element around you know, skin in the game, which, which, which enterprises want the provider to put in. And, and honestly, you know, with, 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 with a lot of the IT becoming synonymous with how the business is run, the, the dependency or, or, the, or the customer experience or the overall user experience is tied a lot more to the service, right? So that's why people want, uh, enterprises want a bit more of that bite, as you may call it, right? Into, into, the, into the total fee at risk. So uh, while 11% is by no means is short change, they just wanna make sure that uh, the, the disincentive for uh, poor service is significant enough to cause a dent in profitability and, and, and thus drive the right behaviors. So, so that, that's one lens to it. The other element which, uh, w which we'll soon see on the bottom half of the slide is that it's not just the total fee at risk, it's also the cumulative pool. And I'll just explain what we mean by that for, for some of those who, who may not be aware, right? So 
each critical service level metric uh, has typically a weightage associated with it. Uh, and and in, in the service credit calculation, it doesn't really add up to 100%. Uh, and the simple reason being that if it's 100%, it would mean that each one of those critical service levels would need to go bad to for, for the penalty to hit this total fee at risk, which is never the intent. It should be the intent that even a subset of the critical service levels going wrong uh, should be enough to, to, to cause that death. So uh, the cap on the cumulative pool typically used to be about 150 to 200 percent. So this would mean that some of the service levels, let's assume there are five service levels, uh, you know, it could be the weightage could be as high as 40 percent on some of them, right? So maybe 30, 30, 40, 40, 40, right? Something like this. Uh, of late, what we're seeing is that because there are a few service levels which are very critical, uh, even that percentage or the cumulative pool has gone up, right? So uh, where a lot of people would be content by 150. Uh, I think the new baseline, which is starting, is somewhere around 180, extending to 240%. Just a bit of a caveat, we've seen deals where it's gone as high, even in the heydays, uh, even in the 2016-17, where it went as high as uh, you know, 280, 300%. Uh, the same is the case now, but that's for very specific scenarios. Here we're talking more of the typical kind of you know, deals with, uh, with anywhere between five to six critical service levels. So I think this is where, uh, this is where uh, the, the ends seem to be tightening, more to drive the right kind of behavior rather than, hey, let's just make this a, another revenue stream or a discount stream. All right. All right. So yeah, let's, let's go ahead and summarize here, Abhishek, and, and then uh, we've got a, a whole bunch of questions here I wanna try to get to. So why don't you kind of summarize what, we're, what, we're, what we've talked about so far, and I'm gonna start looking through these questions and pick a couple of them. Sounds good, sounds good. So we, we just laid out some key implications for enterprises and, and that kind of is, is the gist of what we've discussed uh, in the past 45 odd minutes. Uh, so obviously no surprises, um, you know, IT infrastructure services pricing, it's witnessing material changes and, and material, honestly, I'm being very, very conservative. It's an understatement. Uh, it's highly advisable to get external validation on bids uh, to minimize overpaying or under solutioning, right? So, so it's very, it's, it, it's increasingly important to get that second level of validation to ensure that, that enterprises take the right decision. Second, FTE rates for basic ID services are expected to be flat for offshore locations. Um, however, they could marginally increase in the US and other onshore locations, but it's, it's not gonna be drastic. What this means for enterprises is that if for the very genetic skills, um, there's a bit of a request to, hey, just inordinately raise them or um, you know, cite a lot of inflationary pressures, Again, important to calibrate it and against and see against where they stack against the market. Uh, there could be a chance that, that they're underpaying currently because of legacy reasons. That's a different story altogether. But it has to be calibrated against the going rate or the going range in the market rather than, hey, I'm at X, I need to get it to 1.05X just for, just for the sake of it. Three, uh, do not ignore the seemingly standard cost of doing adjustment clause in your contract. Uh, in my mind, I equate this to something like a, like a reckless credit card usage. You never really know that it's hitting you, but it's constantly siphoning off value from your account. You know, the, the interest rates are high. Um, you know, it's, it's not very visible, but it is a materially hidden choke point, which could be causing significant, you know, value leakage. Fourth, um, the digital focus deals, uh, there is a sequential evolution from time and material to other models, uh, which, which is seen as quite a common, common phenomenon. Um, so the implication is that, hey, uh, the intent may be to get to you know, some, some strong fixed price or per story point development, uh, you know, those kinds of pricing, uh, but it, it, it does take its own you know, method and, and ways or sequence to get there. It's very difficult to just get there on the word go. Uh, finally, uh, higher deal complexity, you know, is needing stronger service management guardrails to ensure right service provider behavior. So, you know, enterprises need to ensure the fee at risk is aligned and equitable. The intent is not to penalize the service provider, um, you know, without any rhyme or reason, but it's also to ensure that there's enough of a bite, as I call it, uh, should service levels go down, that, uh, that yes, there's a huge disincentive for the provider to just be a little lax on some critical service levels. So, so these these are kind of you know some of some of the some of the some of the you know key themes that we've been seeing in the past um, in the past few months. And now uh, maybe we can take a few questions. Yeah. So let me just 
jump. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's, before we go to the questions, I just wanted uh, Abhishek just talk a little bit about your practice here. We, we we try to keep all this on the data side, but you you your practice actually provides a, a series of uh, services that, that that are available. Uh, would you sure, just, absolutely, just, absolutely, quick description absolutely. on those? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so just just a quick uh, you know refresher. As a practice, we uh, serve both sides of the table, um, both enterprises and service providers uh, across a range of mandates. You know, as you can see on the screen. But with the intent being very clearly um, to have uh, to get to an equitable contract, not just from an enterprise perspective, but also from a service provider, get to sustainable contracting that's fair on both parties. So yeah, that's that that's in a nutshell what we do. Okay, and one of the things that we that we're uh willing to offer and this is really geared toward enterprises so those that are buyers of services um, is to try us on some of the stuff that Abhishek talked about on the previous page um, and so what we're offering is a, a price check if you will uh, on on up to three standard roles in three countries and so it's a um, no obligations and you know it's easy to easy to ask for uh, but we'd happy to talk about some of our standard services and those things are like IT infrastructure, IT uh, apps, uh, uh, finance and accounting services, um, what contact center, what else, what else you got in that list there, Abhishek? Yeah, so, so basically it's, it's apps, um, infrastructure, uh, finance and accounting, contact center, uh, and even business consulting, right? So, okay, so no, yeah, that's that, right. Yeah. And then, and then we've got a host of countries. So we have, Many, many uh, roles beyond what we just described there, but but we're offering in kind of our standard roles. If you're interested in that, send us a note, and uh, we'll get you a response back to uh, to, to to kind of a price check uh, in a, in a quick and easy way. So let's go to the questions here on the next page. All right. So one of the questions here, Nabishak, I'll take the first one. If you want to look through, there's a whole bunch of them here. You can pick a couple in the, in the. We got about five, seven minutes here. Um, yeah. So. The RPA and automation changing the pricing structure uh, and blend. And so um, I can't stress how much of a game changer uh, RPA or, or some of the other automation technologies could be to certain contracts. And you know this is, a, this is one of those uh, dilemmas for the service providers in the industry um, where some of the, the business cases are so substantial to take a highly manual process where there may be a lot of FTEs and a lot of revenue generated and, it, and there is the potential, not saying it automatically happens, but potential for uh, a significant amount of automation that reduce reduce the labor and the FTEs required that changes kind of the whole dynamics of what the contract's all about. So the question, first question you're going to ask yourself is what's the incentive for the service provider? Because there is an investment required to make all that happen. It doesn't, it's, it's almost as much about, you know, the process reengineering as it is about the technology implementation, but those things have to be incurred. So you've got to kind of, open up the conversation knowing there's an investment. But but it is a very real potential. And if I was an enterprise right now and nobody's approached me about, hey, how can I bring automation in my contract? I'd wonder uh, wonder what's happening. Why why am I not being hearing about this from my from my service providers? So I think it is a good opportunity. And in the long term, the service providers they know they've got to react to this. They know they've got to maintain competitiveness in the marketplace. And especially as their contract comes up for renewal, that, 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 that there's going to be a test on that. So I think most service providers that are thinking ahead, they know this is coming and they, and they want to get ahead of it before it becomes a, a, real, a real challenge for them in, in a competitive sense. Okay. I'll, I'll maybe take, a, take one or two questions here. So there's a question around, um, you know, is there, have you seen increasing use of productivity targets on providers to offset COLA? Um, for example, provider commits to 8% FTE reduction or X% percent productivity, uh, you know, FTE reduction by October. So uh, it's it's an interesting question, right? And this is where we're merging two elements, you know, one being a macroeconomic uh, indexation adjustment and the other being something very specific to the contours of that particular contract. Uh, what we are seeing and what we're advising also is that productivity, um, and more and more enterprises also want to keep these things separate, right? So there is a separate expectation and demand for productivity improvement. Uh, and that's kind of irrespective of cost of living adjustment. Now, one might argue that yes, it somehow subsumes part of the cost of living adjustment and the net remains the same, but, but it's important to see these two in different lights because they're two different levers, right? So productivity is, ongoing productivity would be linked to, hey, 
uh, can we can the provider bring in better methods, right? Even without major transformations, uh, better methods, better uh, staffing mixes, better uh, productivity, better um, you know more centralization. Just because of ongoing and because the provider is an expert at doing those things, they can do the same thing in a lesser number of resources over years, right? So that's the expectation of the glide path. Um, the cost of link adjustment, um, you know, is tends to be separate, a separate discussion, uh, and that's more to ensure a there's transparency, so the enterprises can see what's really causing the price or total bill to move up or down, um, and, and that's why you know it's it's more a separate conversation these days because otherwise the risk is that they really don't see you know what's really moving the total cost up or down, right? So while uh, you know, short answer, while this may come up in general conversations around, hey, what offsets were one versus the other, um, more and more enterprises are, are, are wanting to keep this, keep this as separate. So let me take, a, let me take the outcome-based pricing question here. And, and you know, it's, outcome pricing always tends to be kind of at the top of the stack. It looks like the ideal situation. And, uh, and I always like to talk about outcome pricing, you know, where you get true alignment and, and all the investments are being brought to bear. But it's also the trickiest one to sustain, and and the challenge goes into, uh, you know, you, you get away from the cause and effect relationship sometimes, and you also get into, you know, how long should the supplier capture value from making an improvement? So let me give you an example. If I have something that costs a uh, uh, hundred dollars today, and I make that significant investment, and I make the significant improvement, uh, and I, and I'm impacting revenues, or I'm impacting customer satisfaction, and I and I make something in in uh, uh, an enhanced improvement to to make all those nice metrics get better. Should I benefit financially, you know, in the short term? Yes. Should I better benefit in the long in the medium term? Probably yes. Should I benefit in perpetuity or in the long term? You know, I think that's what you got to ask yourself is, you know, is this a you know like a winning the lottery ticket where the service provider gets to have uh, high margins and in perpetuity because they brought something to the table. Um, I think that's where you get uh, the unalignment possibilities or, or misalignment, if you will. Um, so I think there's a real balancing act of you know who makes the investment, who gets the credit, who takes the risk, um, and how much long how long do you, do you allow that value transfer uh, to to occur for? And, and and my general thoughts on that have been, you know, you definitely want to pay uh, pay a premium for uh, you know, them taking the risk or service provider taking the risk. Uh, but, and maybe that's over a couple of years of showing, hey, we're going to give you uh, a bonus for that, uh, but not, you know, not in perpetuity. Abhishek, you want to take one more question? Yeah. So uh, there was one question around. Um, um, yeah, so around fee, how fee, what is fee at risk and how is it um, connected with, with COLA? Um, kindly explain. So, so yeah, just, 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 just to confirm, uh, the fee at risk is basically uh, the total amount of or, or percentage of the monthly fee which the service provider receives for the service, uh, which is at risk or you know, can be uh, applied as a penalty, right? Um, for service level defaults, right? So if it's $100 as the monthly fee and the fee at risk is 15%, it means that in any month, the service level default related penalty cannot go more than 15%, right? So, so that, that's basically the fee at risk. Uh, how is it connected to COLA? Uh, the way we've described it here were two separate themes. We wanted to pick up two separate contracting tenants around COLA and, and, and fee at risk. They just happen to be in the same section, so in, 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 they're not really connected to each other. It's just that they were contiguous in the in the presentation. These are two very different themes, but in the broader context of contracts and tenants. So just a bit of a clarification there. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and wrap on that basis. Uh, we always want to end on time here, so um, you can obviously reach out. Uh, uh, Abhishek and my at my email addresses that are on the screen. Uh, they'll be part of the the, the presentation when you get that uh, in, in the next day or two. Uh, we can also show you the uh, way to access through the through the blog, uh, or we have a number of related uh, pieces of research content here that uh, certainly you can uh, reach out to us and we can we can help you get access to those. Um, but again, I think this is an extremely hot topic. 
Um, it always it had it has been in perpetuity. It's not something it's it's brand new topic, but it's certainly an important topic because it is how uh, value gets equated in the you know not just in the initial part of the deal, but it's the ongoing invoice that equates uh, lots of cause and effect relationships between uh, money getting transferred between your your enterprise and the service provider. So with that, we wish you uh, a good day and uh, thanks for your participation. And thank you to Michael and, and Abhishek, and thanks for everyone for attending today's webinar. Again, you'll receive a follow-up email within one to two business days with a link to download the presentation slides, along with an on-demand playback of today's live session. On behalf of the Everest Group and our presenters, thanks for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.